Phil Scott, welcome to the Pacing Performance Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much, Rob. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you for thank you for jumping on. Feels like it's been a long time coming, but I'm I'm really pleased to have you and to dive into a particular area which is growing in momentum. And I thought I find these things fascinating how certain things, certain tests, certain ways of doing things do take off. And I think this is pretty driven by a couple of different people. Um, but yeah, we'll dive into the anaerobic speed reserve and how you've implemented some of them things uh, into your work. But before we do, a little bit of background on you, and then we'll have a little chat around dispelling a few myths with regards to cricket, mm-hmm. but bio, bio first. Bio first. Okay, so I'm currently the England men's strength and conditioning coach. I've been with, with England for eight, eight years now. Um, prior to that, I was at um, Lancashire Cricket, and then prior to that, um, a few varying roles, to be honest, um, that went from tennis to, um, I guess, university-based sports in some of the scholarship athletes at, at, at Swansea University, which was um, was an amazing experience. Um, so, yeah, but a large chunk of my time has mostly been um, in the cricket world in the last few years. Did you cut your teeth in the university setting? That- Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a real... Um, a, a real step in the right direction, given a lot of um, time to work with a real diverse population of athletes. And I guess um, it was 2009, 2010, um, that at Swansea, they set up that role and I was the first one to at that university to take that role on. And no one really knew what was expected or what was supposed to happen. They kind of said, look, there's, there's a load of um, uh, university scholarship athletes, these guys that varied from national to international we even had a world champion in there uh, along the way, a world champion surf kayaker. So, it was, you know, it was an amazing experience to have those that array of, of athletes who were really keen to to uptake it. And um, and I, I yeah, I got to kind of crack on and, and try a few things. And um, it was it was an excellent experience to to build build towards the, the professional environment. I've said this a few times, and I, I, I feel like I don't have to apologise for for saying it. I think university setting especially for early slash mid career strength and conditioning coach is so good because you just group after group after group after group there's not that pressure that you you would get now working for England cricket or or similar I just think it's a great environment to be at and not to be I don't know not going the way but you you, we can often get weekends off you're going to get bank holidays you're going to get a decent allowance you're going to get a pension all them kind of things that Kind of add to a, a package. University ticks a lot of boxes, and Absolutely. I think yeah, I, I'm I'm a big fan, big fan. I think you get you get an amazing um, set of facilities really as well, um, and you get for me I had access to some brilliant lecturers who who are on tap to to help me and um, to help me grow in that area as well. So um, it was a, a further free education really. And you get people coming through the university doing testing or pre-season testing, rugby league. We, I had rugby league and rugby union. Then you can get involved with them and build up network and things. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm a big, big fan. Right, let's dispel a few myths in cricket because I don't want to be too harsh, but people may think <laughs> people may think it's just a lot of guys standing around. So have let like, dispel a few myths for us when it comes to demands. Yeah, I get it. I, it, it it's it's deceptive this sport um and i would love to dispel a few myths um i guess the first one i'm not going to go root in any near any rules because that can get a bit complicated but fundamentally and keep this really simple we've got three formats we've got the really short format the t20 we've got the one day format which lasts you know seven eight hours and then we've got the test match which lasts up to five days now um particularly the test match that five day experience um it it does seem a lot slower but what these guys um what these guys do is 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 quite phenomenal really and and i guess even i working in cricket until i got hold of the gps systems to to profile and understand what they did and even they even the players themselves they they didn't believe what they did and i and it it was a bit of a shock so if i start if i start the shorter format the t20 which is 20 overs each it's about an hour and a half of batting or fielding at a time and obviously so it's three hours in total and the the bowlers in particular with the fielding will cover up to 8k even in that even that hour and a half um if you're then going on to bat as well and you are successful you might look at between one and three k depending on how much running between the wickets you're doing 
the bit that the, the intensity comes from is that they're up, they're going up to 300 meters of, of high intensity sprinting and there'll be around a hundred uh, max X cells and D cells within that game as well. So it's, it's a lot to take on. Um, and bear in mind that I guess in a tournament scenario, we, it's a relatively short tournament for those, those kind of um, for those T20 games. So what, one experience we had was eight games in 21 days with six flights so that's a game every two and a half days if you get to the final, which we, with that experience, we did. Um, and it just, it's, it's that ability to sustain that performance and recover from that, plus, you know, throwing a bit of jet lag as well. So these guys, they work hard for, for even at that T20 scenario. Um, the one day matches, um, obviously they go a bit further, but it's a similar intensity. So, you know, you're looking up to 16K a game for the bowlers. If the batters are going to go on and score 100, um, in their innings, that it could be between five and seven k. Um, again, similar high intensity amount of uh, excels and D cells and sprinting work. Um, and the te- this one, this one's the big one, the test match, the five day. So if a if a bowler is going to bowl forty overs in a in a match over those five days, then we've worked out it's around fifty k of an average total distance for that for that match. The highest we've seen this year actually was sixty seven kilometers covered. In, in a game, five, in five days, over, over those it was yeah four and a half days, um, and then I, the other thing just to, that I like to throw in there is that these guys have a couple of days training in as well. So if you chuck in another seven k um, in, a, in a, through the training week, because we have said a couple of days, two three days leading in, then they potentially cover up to sixty five seventy k. Then they're asked to repeat that seven times throughout the summer. That's it's a lot of distance and a lot of repeatability purely from a total distance the bowlers um i say within that 50k uh, again around 7k that is above 20ks an hour and around 3k of that is above 25ks an hour and just for a bit more framing i guess um you're looking at standing in a field for 17 hours so when i explain this to my parents who um to translate the numbers i said basically for a few days in a row go for a walk with the dog um, for six hours in a day o- over the course of the day and every three minutes I want you to do a 20 meter sprint that's <laughs> yeah. that's the layman's translation of what they fundamentally do through these test matches so um, yeah it's a lot and and I, once once we got once we were able to explain that to the players and us as, as um, the science and medicine staff as well that wow this is what we're dealing with um, can we raise the game and the expectations and the conditioning of these guys to cope with that so yeah, it was a big change at that point. Good numbers, good stats. When did you get into cricket? When was the when was your first job in cricket? Uh, 2012. 2012. How, no. how has physical preparation changed since then? I suppose what was what was what's it been like traditionally, and then how has it developed since you've been involved since 2012? Uh, it's changed a lot, I would say. I think um, my first experience, uh, my first morning. Of, of walking into to cricket was although I, I'd done a bit of cricket before I, I, but as a lead was was still a shock and I, I don't think it's out of it wasn't out of laziness or it wasn't out of they they couldn't be bothered it was just they didn't have the resources and the, they didn't know what they didn't know at, at a certain point um we do now know what we didn't know um now but it first my first job was to just turn up and sort the breakfast out um there was just uh, some toast in the corner with some cocoa pops, pops and some some cornflakes. And it's it breakfast. It's your there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Podcast breakfast. Yes, um, it was yeah. It was it, it just things like that that they hadn't had access to necessarily the full nutrition support, the the full S and C support. And I think um, you know the the, the, every, the qualifications and the experience that the guys are guys and girls are coming in now as S and Cs to the county and cricket setup is is obviously you know education's come along and we've all come a long way in the, even the last 10 years so um and the players when i first turned up yeah they were i guess slightly behind and it wasn't as professional as it is now but they were they were desperate to learn and it was the, my first year with um with lancashire and in county cricket was was one of my favorites because i was a bit nervous i was like okay i've got to take this on and are they going to listen and how's it going to go? But they were so desperate to learn and so keen to move forward that um, 
it was an amazing experience. They, they absolutely took off because they were like, wow, this is okay. I feel quite good now. And this is what it feels like when I'm fit and I can, I can play properly. So, um, and that goes for, you know, the county setup and the practitioners we've got around now are all excellent. Um, and we're lucky that as a group, we, we communicate and pass on information and we, we get to spend quite a bit of time with each other the way the games are set up as well. It's not you're passing football ships. It's sometimes four days um, that you're, you're around each other. So um, it's a very open environment within cricket as, the, as a practitioner, as well as um, the players having absorbed a lot of information and, and knowing what they, what they need to do. Great. Love it. Good insight into, into the world of cricket, various forms. So we're going to have a little chat, like I said, 10 minutes ago, anaerobic speed reserve. Had Gareth Sanford on for a couple of episodes, uh, part one and part two, back to back, diving into this in, in lots of detail. So if people want a really detailed view of what anaerobic speed reserve is, definitely check that out. However, it'd be great to get a, a, a brief review and then of, of what it is. And then why you went down this route, what answers, sorry, what questions does it answer that you had? All right. So... Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think if I take, if I'm allowed to take it a step further back, I think go for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I had a uh, when training um, the the guys. Um, I guess a, a couple of things stood out for me aerobically um, that I was I was trying at least in the gym to um, individualize. You know, alongside their previous injury history and. Um, their, their role within the team. And uh, I was trying to individualize at that time a few years ago. Well, we were individualizing what they were doing. And it didn't quite make sense to me that we were just aerobically programming fundamentally the same thing. Uh, it was periodized, but still quite general for everyone. Um, the other thing that stood out for me was that some of them hated it. And I, I guess you do to a certain extent, it hurts. But it wasn't just that it hurts. They, it's, they were like, this is. They just, it didn't suit them. There was something that didn't make sense. And some of the guys were like, I hate, I hate long runs. I've never been on a long run in my life. Why are we doing, you know, three minutes on? I've, uh, even that for some of them, it, they were just argue, not arguing, but they were putting their point across. And I, I, I couldn't, I, I, as we all like to be able to justify why we're doing something. I couldn't justify why they were feeling like that. And, um. I did so. I started just not necessarily going near the anaerobic speed reserve or, or anything like that. I just started reading everything possible on um, aerobic development, and obviously there's some amazing stuff out there from you know Larson and Boucher and um, David Bishop and and the papers that, that go along those lines. And then I got to a point of so I'm, I, I kind of had absorbed a lot of information, but I was like still. Still, these guys are still, something's not clicking. So I said, I, um, I made a call to Ben Rosenberg. I said, right, who are your, who are your go-tos? Who's in this area? Who are your go-tos? And um, thankfully, uh, he mentioned Gareth Sanford and um, Dan Laverpour as well, which I'll, I'll talk about later what I learned from that. But that's where, that's where this whole, for me, this, this concept of individualizing um, the aerobic piece as, 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 as best as possible came from. Um, obviously Gareth has covered that, um, in huge detail in, in that chat he, he had with you, but, um, to kind of re go over, I guess it's, it's, it's take, if you're going to work above your maximum aerobic speed, then if you don't take into consideration that their top, their top speed, their maximal speed, then it, it, it some athletes will have more efficiency and more in the tank left to work with than others. Um, so if we take an example of uh, athlete A runs at 17, uh, has an MAS of um, 17 Ks an hour. So say athlete A and athlete B have 17 Ks an hour as their max aerobic speed. If we program for them at 140% of that max aerobic speed, that comes out at 23.8 um, Ks an hour. So it, it, that's how we, I guess, previous or it, it's, it's, it could be generalized. To take in the maximum aerobic speed, if we program at 40% of their ASR, athlete A will be going at 22.1 Ks an hour, and athlete B will be going at 23.4. That's, a, that's fundamentally a, it's a big difference over the course of whatever you're programming, you know, 15 seconds on, 15 off, whatever it is. And 
And that for me was why some guys were blowing up um, and going, I can't complete it. And they're going, you're lazy. Blah, blah, blah. Whereas the other guys were going, this is too easy. And I'm like, why am I not? I'm trying to program this as precisely as possible, but we're still getting discrepancies. So I guess that's a further piece on how it came about for me and also why it's so important to take into the, into consideration those two those two points. Yeah. So to, to, to conduct a prof, to get the profile, MAS, in what, what kind of test are you doing to get the MAS? So um, for cricket, for what we're, we're using the 2K time trial and um, we have access to a track at Loughborough. We also have a lovely round field to run around um, wherever we go in the world and we've, we've got grass as consistency as well. So we're happy with the ability to, um, to go with that test um, from a validity point of view, um, from an easy, easy, easy way of, um, it's an easy test to administer. Um, but also, um, not that you should hang your hat on one particular article or journal or anything, but um, there's there's support out there from, there's a, a paper from 2015, Bellinger, um, that did some work with the um, AFL guys in Australia. Um, and and found that that two K particularly was a was a very valid measure of of maximum aerobic speed. So that it kind of was like, well, it's perfect. Um, so we 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 moved we've been moved to that for the last few years. Okay, so you've got your MAS and you've got your maximal sprinting speed. Thirty meters, twenty thirty meters. So what we do is we do it. We've got the ability to do a forty meter sprint. Our boundaries generally go, you know, up to sixty, even seventy meters. So. I like quite a long um, sprint as such. To get their max, to get their max sprint speed, what I found previously was um, I took it between twenty and thirty, or thirty and forty. Um, and then, having done a bit of research, I immediately cut that down to a five meter time and gate split, which makes a huge difference uh, in terms of your accuracy. Um, I th- so I'll do a we'll, we'll do a ten meter, a twenty meter, a twenty five meter split, a thirty meter split. 35 meter split and a and a 40 but generally 90 percent of my guys will be hitting their max speed within 20 to 25 or 25 to 30 um and that's really key uh, in terms of getting a very accurate number so you've got these two numbers where do we go from where do, where do you go from there well this is the exciting bit for me that i that got um unveiled by gareth so suddenly you, you've got your your max sprint speed which you can divide by your max aerobic speed, and that gives you a ratio. Now, in in Gareth's case, with working with um, elite middle distance runners, um, that threw out a certain uh, a certain ratio. For me, um, I applied the same concept to my guys, so international cricketers who are uh, our average two k time when 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 I first did it was sixteen point two so ironically or amazingly exactly the same as that Bellinger paper as well, which was gave me a bit more confidence um, and then from there i and I guess this is some creative license created my own um, divisions so with that with that ratio um, if you've got um, if you've got those aerobic type profiles, um, you've got those speed type profiles. For me, I was working at above 1.8 um, being the speedsters and below 1.7 as the aerobic guys. In between that, that's what I've referred to as the mixed profile. And when I when I first put this into the into my sheet and had a look, it I also put some, hopefully put some common sense and some um, reasoning behind it. And it, and who I, where I would put certain, the speedsters ended up as the speedsters and where I put, I mean, I guess the speedsters are really obvious and the aerobic guys, they're really obvious. Um, so they, they fit quite nicely. And then there was a, I guess, um, a mix of, a mix of the guys in that mixed, in that middle category um, who, Actually, when you come to think of it, and when you come to talk to these guys, um, some of the conversations are: What would you pref- what, what do you prefer doing? If I let's say you could go for a, a two, three, four, five k, or you could do a sprint session, they can't really answer you. Um, and so it was it was nice to it was nice to see them sitting um, very biased view, but it was nice to see them sitting in the middle where they couldn't really make up their minds, as arguably down to their physiology. 
so this is how I, that's how I follow Gareth's um, sprint profile, aerobic profile, and mix, but in my own world as such, because cricketers definitely don't match up to um, elite middle distance runners. Yeah, so that one point seven, one point eight, and the guys in between. And I, was it? To, it was just common sense, a little bit of reasoning that came that you ended up at them ratios. Yeah, uh, yes, basically, it's very unscientific. Um, it's it, and and even um, even visually, once I put it on, it actually it kind of just it it fit the, the the categories kind of created themselves. So when I first did it, there was two or three guys that were aerobic and like really aerobic. They just can keep going all day. They can recover really quickly. They've got no interest in in hanging around for a rest period, and and vice versa with those speed guys. They 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 need all the rest in the world and they blow up quickly. Um, it, it kind of it, it really did fit as nicely as as I could have hoped. From there, you do there has been um, introductions of new players and um, and people that do ask a few more questions. Um, but yeah, absolutely. First of all, it was just applying a relatively non scientific um, common sense to the to the process that Gareth had put forward. Okay, so we've got these three profiles. Yes. Where do we go from there when it comes to actually programming? So, I guess again to take to take um, it back a slight step in terms of my my justification, reasoning, and thoughts, and even some of the research that's come out more recently. Um, and I guess reiterate a point I've, I've slightly made is some of these guys. Well, um, when we're trying to get aerobically fitter. Uh, for me, applying a blanket, uh, a blanket approach to everyone, just it doesn't work. Um, some guys, I guess you've got your responders and your non-responders to a lot of work that we do, and I believe this fiber typology is starting to um, unveil a little bit of 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 why we're getting we're getting those two different categories. From an aerobic development point of view, um, if I was if I was doing a blanket interval session in a pre-season and it was say a minute on 30 off a deliberately two to one ratio for that aerobic development those aerobic guys it, it didn't touch the side it really it, it's it it wasn't enough and sometimes you and you get them going can i do some more um whereas the speed guys the sprinters um the guys with that high max max sprint speed would still blow up and they'd go okay they'd start really well but then they'd they really would blow up and they some of them not able to, to um, complete that session so um uh, there's also i guess there's also that research around um i really hope i'm saying her name correctly here but aline livens um I, I, i've only days. read her her work so i'm i'm really sorry um, I've not actually had anyone say her name officially to me, but um, you look at the, the the recovery profiles of those guys with fast fast twitch, more of a fast twitch fiber setup and a more of a slow twitch. Um, and I think they in twenty twenty she did um, a study with thirty three thirty seconds all out wing gates, and um, the power drop off for the fast twitch guys was um, was sixty one percent, whereas the the slow twitch guys were only forty one percent, and then um, on top of that, the slow twitch guys were recovered after 20 minutes. And I love this bit. Um, the fast twitch guys were not recovered even five hours later. There's still a significant drop off. And that just sums up for me these this what we experience out with these team sports athletes who have such a range of um I guess yeah, a range of um physiology that we're dealing with, um, and why some guys go, oh, I don't really want it, I'm I feel fine. And the others are like walking in like they've just completed just the biggest workout in the world. So, um, yeah, that's that's for me that really why these categories and and what we could what, why we need to um, individualize is so important. Was your question? Do you want to get into the? Um, do you want to get? So I've gone on a bit of a rant there. No, do you that's want, fine. Do you want no, to... no, that's good. No, I think you framed the framed the next bit, which is which was the the question, which was how are you actually programming for these. Yeah. So what do what uh, the contrast of sessions and I'm interested in that middle group as well yeah. so yeah um so if i start with the aerobic guys um as i as i've mentioned 
these guys, we need lo- uh, longer intervals um, to fundamentally give them time to get into that um, that time at VO2 max, that, that for me, 90%, what I call the red zone, 90% above um, time at VO2 max. Um, so a long interval. So minimum for me, if they're really aerobic, two minutes, four minutes up, um, up around four minutes. Um, I usually always work with a two to one ratio. There's a lot of work by David Bishop that's been done and it just seems to keep coming back to keep being able to find that balance to keep them in those, in that red zone, particularly in that time of age, which is really important. Um, and this is where I mentioned earlier that Dan Laverpool, um, he, he gave me a lot of ideas in this area, but, um, I've used previously 1K ladders. So if you think these guys are covering, um, if they're going at, you know, 18Ks an hour, that's a, that's a, what's a three and a half minute 2K. So it's a three and a half minute K, sorry. So if you look at some 1K ladders, um, I found my aerobic guys really enjoy them. I start them relatively slowly. So if, if, they're, if they're doing 1K in 3.30, I might start them at um, even four minutes or 3.50 and then take 10 seconds off for each ladder and we go up to 5K. And they're very cocky at the beginning. Um, <laughs> they're, 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 this is Give too easy. This is way, but that accumulation and that build up um, allows them to time to get in, in into that red zone and then and then hold that as well. So there's there's there are a couple of um, longer intervals that I've used for those guys. The sprinters, um, I found for the, some more explosive guys, even a sprint session, I feel like they they can adapt aerobically to because it's such it's such work for them. But fundamentally, a sprint session, but um, uh, we've done uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 meter of, of sprinting, um, but with a jog back. So little mani- manipulation of variables like that um, with two to three minute rest periods. And, and then they go they can go again and trying to hold them around 90% of their max sprint speed. So they're not completely blowing out from a hamstring point of view. Um, one of One of my go-tos for these sprinters has been what I call aerobic tempos. Um, so we, we look around 100 meters of, well, 100 meters of distance. They complete that 100 meters in around 16 seconds, but then with an active, an active jog back to the start, they go on the minute. And we can break that up with, um, in uh, cricket loves sixes because it's because the uh, six balls bowled in and over. So I generally break that up in overs or sixes. Um, and, and give them a couple of minutes in between. And we very quickly find they can accumulate a lot of, a lot of um, time at VO2 max in that red zone. Um, and that, those sprinters, they prefer that. They'd rather get their, their time at VO2 max in that setting than going even close to a 1K ladder. That just, that just, just doesn't work. Um, I, you mentioned the mixed group. Um, quite, I guess, a bit of a cop-out answer is... you. You, you've got options. You've got a lot of options. You've got all of those options. Maybe not to the extremes. I, I probably don't go to the extremes in terms of even a mixed um, profile. I wouldn't necessarily jump straight towards that uh, 1K ladder. It might be more of a, a 500 meter ladder, um, and they because they they can go towards a you know more of a two minute interval for me um, rather than having to push them up towards that three four. Um, Again, the that they they respond they seem to respond very well to these aerobic intervals and some repeated sprint training. So they they have for me the it's easier programming, um, and um, I think the yeah it, it's you've got more options. Um, it's just the extreme guys that um, I tend to generally keep more in their categories. The aerobic tempos that you do, why did you go down that route in terms of a, a tempo and just a like a sixteen second blanket versus any more individualized options? Um, I, I guess, well, the one thing that's the tempos are already there, and it's something that um, I guess cricket. When, when I turned up at cricket, that was it's always been around. I think probably three things that have been around are 30 second on, 30 second off, um, 23 sevens. Um, so 30, uh, you complete 50 meters in seven seconds. You've got 23 seconds off, usually a return and then go again. And um, the 100 meter repeats. So it was, 
it was not something I was um, needed to throw out. It was already sitting there. And I thought with a, with a bit of a tweak, we could make real good use of this. Um, and I know there's, I, I don't want to get into, I, I don't, you know, that, that tempo um, um, kind of session, that's, that's for others and not for now, but um, I'm comfortable with using that word because it is a rhythm. And the other thing, um, there's, for me, the tempo comes from the idea that it's a, ry- a rhythm run, um, which also from a cricket point of view, which is probably why it's been around, sits very well with the bowlers. So if these guys are going to run in all day with their, with their run-up, and their run-ups are 30, 40 metres long sometimes, um, you can sell this session particularly really nicely with them or, um, because they have to get up to a rhythm, hold it, and that's what, they're going to be, that's what they're going to be going at. We can get a bit of time on feet, accumulation of, of distance at, at, the right, at the right speed. So it was an easy, it was, we already had it, easy sell, um, and with a slight manipulation of some variables, we get a really good adaptation out of it. So would you ever would you ever get those sprint guys, bring them down into a more mixed session, or get the aerobic guys and bring them up into the more mixed and and basically would you contrast which group they're in? Ye- ever? Yes, I, I I would. I think um, I think in terms of um, probably where we're where I'm at or where we're at with with this with this um, kind of concept is the guys have been introduced to it. They're very comfortable with. They know they can, they know they can get a lot out of these sessions. They're very efficient sessions for for wherever they sit, and absolutely, that's it's not ruled out that you're not allowed to go and do that, or you're not allowed. Um, I just think um, it's it probably more appropriate for certain times of the season. We've got a very congest, congested year always, so um, I'm a, I guess part of my sell to them was if you're going to do something, I want it, I, I want an adaptation. And I want it to be efficient as well. So I I kind of know, and they kind of know now, if they go and do the opposite end of the spectrum for aerobic development, it's not really gonna it's not really gonna have as much of an impact as so but if we've got a six, eight week period leading into a tour, um, and we've got time and and options, and I can increase that volume of of some of the other end of the spectrum that allows adaptation or or reduce that volume, then then yes, we can we can make the use of that, make use of that. But I guess I'm I'm trying to be as efficient and targeted as possible with the with this with the scenario we have. Because in the in this setup, that's not to say these aerobic guys are not doing sprint work. Hundred percent. It's just when Let's the goal is aerobic that, yeah. development. Yes. That's not their that's not their thing. They're all doing um they're all doing their sprint work and we we sprint um obviously weekly um they sprint through the matches and it's all um it's all appropriate levels they have to sprint because we're, we're, we're fundamentally looking to push their performance levels and raise their their asr and and keep them healthy and hamstrings and all of that 100 percent. yeah sorry i should have probably said that at the beginning no, no, that's fine. People, that's, um that's yeah they're, they're, they're all sprinting and um and, and that fits into the piece as well yeah so man- management of this so you've potentially got three different groups. Mm. How do you manage that logistically? It's, uh, it's great. It's 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 lovely when so um, obviously if I, so if the, my one of my favourite scenes once we got up and running with this, um, we had three different sessions going on at once um, on the field, and um, the guys have got their watches. So um, I was I was lucky to enough to get um, the squad a, a, a set of Garmin. So the aerobic guys, they're all programmed into the watch. Why am I? Kind of, they hear the buzz and, and they go off in their groups. Um, we can have um, a, a sprint session going on, which is relatively easy to manage because um, it's a nice long rest period. So you can coach them technically whilst they're going. They've got nice long rest periods. Repeated sprints um, with, with run two between the wickets and with turns. Um, so we, and once they, un, once they know exactly what they're supposed to be doing, um, I can't run with those guys and you know shout at them when they're going around this 600 meter oval. So there has to be a little bit of independence and um, but so yeah, they can we can set things up um, brilliantly and and they can they can crack on and if there is a big group, um, which has doesn't always happen, but it, it is possible. Um, the only thing I'd say is when I did when I did start this, um, coaches coaches were like, well, they're not running very far and. 
why are why, well, they lazy and why are they taking so long for their rest period? And so there's a little bit of an education piece um, to the coaches to explain they are adapting, they're working relatively. Um, you know, if you've got those interval sessions and and you are and you are basing it on that ASR, then some of them might be five meters ahead, ten meters ahead. Um, and you just have to make sure the coaches are aware so that they're not starting to um, create any any rhetoric around the players that isn't necessarily positive, which it should be. So you're pre-programming the watches for each individual so they have their own, each individual goal? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's one of, it's, it's a, I guess, relative, a bit of the beginning set up, but once you bang it in, they can crack yeah. on. Okay, nice. So the big thing, results. What results yeah. have you had since introducing this? Well, I mean, we've actually just, um, I guess a bit of a shout out, we've just published a paper on on some of our phys- physical changes over, um, well, up, just up to just after the World Cup um, between 2016 and 2020. Uh, he, like, like huge changes. Um, so aerobic the only caveat with this is aerobically when i first started we were with the the, we did the yo-yo which um we obviously got rid of and we're into the 2k but um we've we've gone from around when we first introduced the 2k which is around just over 15 k's an hour for our mas as i said we we finished up around around one of our peaks around 16.2 k's an hour um for an for for a team average which um for me, I'm 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 happy with with the kind of optimal aerobic um, levels that we would need for these guys to play play international cricket and recover. Um, if you were to take the yo-yo scores, we went from fairly low. If I give you a level which was just below level 19 to um, just above level 20 um, for the for the yo-yo. So the, 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 there have been huge huge changes, and it, it's. I guess what we've also seen is um, a complete buy-in around physical prep um, in general from that strength side, that aerobic side, and that nutrition input as well. So um, the guys of the guys, the, the skin folds have come down while the aerobic piece has gone up, and they've 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 improved all around. So and it, it's been amazing to watch. And it's I think it's that for me with the aerobic piece at least the how happy they were with the individualization and the conversation we were able to have. And a couple of people who had maybe been through a lot of, who really didn't sit in the categories that previously people wanted to, when they're doing blanket approach, that some of the reactions were like, yes, yes, I've been trying to say this, but I don't know what to do about it. And the guys, and, and they may not have been aerobically as developed because say they were sprinters and they don't want to do long runs. So they just, they just, suck it off but now they've been taken into account and respected and individualized they were able to push their aerobic capacity through the roof as well which um they've obviously benefited from and and, and it's changed uh, even the coaches views of them as well so um yeah it's been huge you mentioned the publication hmm. what cricket seems pretty good when it comes to sharing in terms of yes. peer review yeah, well, why is why do you think cricket has got that mentality so i I think um i guess firstly maybe the setup and the structure of cricket itself we've got the ecb and the england team and fundamentally all the counties are financially supported by the ecb so there's a buy-in towards um you know if you're going to be receive x amount of money you've you're happy to to give as well and as much as these counties um, are competing against each other, I think because of the setup and the structure, at least with as practitioners and SNCs and physios, we share a lot. Um, we have we have a WhatsApp group together. People bang on papers. Um, we have you know CPD days that um, we haven't done too much since COVID, but we, we usually do CPD days where practitioners will. Um, present what they've done in this uh, in their winter programs and what went well what didn't and it it just strangely seems very open to communication and no one's there to get one over um and i, I think we're really lucky with that and and 
I think the the push from us recently in terms of if we're publishing something is to be open and show that where cricket is now and and what is happening and you know we're open to 100% open to learning and can we get anything else from anyone else so um hopefully there's no egos and we're 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 keen to open our book and say this is what this is what we do and and within cricket as i say everyone is it, it's a brilliant bunch of practitioners we're very keen to share so we're really lucky with that and i appreciate there's not every sport can do that because of it, it's not it's not governed like that but um since we are we're, we're lucky we can do that i was speaking to robin thorpe uh at some point during covid and, and he he described the importance for him to keep that one eye and part of his brain within that scientific process as a sports scientist to keep that academic side going. Is that important for you as a practitioner to keep peer review publication as a, as a, as a kind of a constant? Um, personally, in terms of actually publishing, it's great, but no, it's not my um, reading and keeping up to date. And absolutely. Um, I, th- I guess it's nice and it's a bonus, but it's not why I personally do X that we've, it just so happens we've got the information. Why not put it out there and, um, and I guess see what happens and, and allow it to be discussed and critiqued. So, um, yeah, it's, it's great, but it, it's not necessarily my first, my first, um, port of call personally. That's just my, my point of view. Yeah, that's cool. I've just got a few more questions on the, on the fast bowlers. Cause because the loads that they go through and the management, I'm guessing for the fast bowlers, the management that you have to um, put in place to get them through five days or multiple five days. Is there anything you do on the aerobic side to look after those in a particular way? Do you deal with them slightly different than the rest or do they get, they've got a, they're, they're in a bucket, they're in the aerobic, in the speed, they're in the middle and they're with everyone else. Or do you, make any adjustments for those guys yeah when we've got i guess maybe more context as well when we've got back-to-back tests there's periods where we we don't really get a chance to um push them and and do an aerobic session so um they might do that um 50k 40 overs uh on a on a thursday to monday and then we're sometimes playing three days later so have a three we have a travel day a training inverted commas day, i.e. recovery day, recovery day, and then they play again. So I, I wouldn't. I, sometimes I, I, they are sore. They are really, really sore with with bowling that many overs with that much load through their bodies. Um, so it fundamentally becomes an active recovery session. Um, we sometimes, well, we have with the hotels, we have access to pools. They have their hands on mass- massage nutrition is is completely taken care of we try to sleep as much as their cricketers are good at sleeping anywhere um at any time particularly fast bowlers um but i will be very um i will be keen in that period for them to to move uh, and and we'll do an active recovery and 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 to be honest that might even look like um i said those the, the 100 meter tempos but it'll be with a walk back and they can kind of take their time but they always feel obviously feel a lot a lot better from it so um it, it with within within the season like that um when we do get a break yes i'll push them and most likely back into the categories what's interesting is with those bowl i haven't got any fast fast bowlers i've got any fast bowlers in an aerobic zone okay and, that's the next question yeah yeah and maybe um if they're going to be able to bowl 85 miles an hour or more you've got to have a lot of fast twitch fibers for that and that doesn't suit an aerobic kind of person um so they're able to get aerobically very fit, but it, it, it just fits, it more suits them. They're mostly in that high mix category. Um, so yeah, we, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting group. Have you made any change along the way to them 1.7, 1.7 to 1.8 and 1.8 as you've gone on? Has anything been tweaked in them numbers or has it been steady and it seems to be, seem to fit? Yeah, I've, I've, um, what I've found is, um, uh, no, I, to those categories, I haven't. What I've, I've, in terms of on my page, I haven't. What I have seen is, um, is, is, a, is a, a few more, once we hit that aerobic, um, that aerobic standard, um, then 
because we're pushing that maximum sprint speed, we, we see those ratios just go up a bit more. So we'll probably push more guys into that 1.9 and twos um, than, than anything than, than changing those standards. The only other thing I guess in, uh, uh, you've not asked the question, but I'm going to give the information. That's please, all right. Yeah, but, crack it um, in. Please do. The, in terms of, in terms of, for, for me personally, with with when a pro, applying this approach, if you're not aerobically fit enough in general, this doesn't work. So for me, that minimum standard for the guys I work with is 15 k's an hour, um, MAS of 15 k's an hour, or an eight, a minimum of eight minutes for two k's. Like that's your. If you're less than that, just go. We're going to go and do some work, and it doesn't matter. What, it's not going to be pretty. <laughs> it's just going to work. Um, I think what I've started to notice for the different groups for the aerobic group, although that say that eight minutes for a 2k is my uh, minimum standard or uh, 15k is now for that aerobic group, those aerobic profile, my minimum standard of where they really are or really should be is less than seven minutes. Um, so 17 k is an hour. If they're less than that, even by their own and the conversation we have even by their own standards, they're like, I'm not in good shape at the moment. Um, and that's what I've start, started to see consistently with those guys. That mixed group, for them to be in a good place aerobically, their minimum standard seems to be um, 16 Ks an hour or more. So a seven minute 30 for a 2K. And your, your explosive, your sprinters, for them to feel like they're in a great shape, great place aerobically, they are between 7.30 and eight minutes. Um, and... So as much as you can say we've got a minimum standard, really each group for me, I feel like has got their own minimum standard as well. Um, and and it's and when you speak to them, it's not just me going, this is what I think it is. They're like, and I'm off the mark or I'm in great shape. And a, yeah, a sprint great shape could be 740, whereas a sprint out of shape could be 805. But a 740 for a sprinter aerobically for a 2K if my aerobic guys turned up with that, I'd be like, what is, what's happened? Like, did you run backwards? It's, it's, they would be miles off the mark. So it's, for me, it's taken that, that next level of, um, of what the categories almost could or should be doing as well. Amazing. I think this episode has been such an incredible compliment to Gareth's two-parter. So I'll, I'll, I'll link to Gareth's two-parter. Um, and I think, did you make the intro to Gareth for me? Or did you mention Gary? I I, I I don't know. I, I I would have if I had the opportunity. Um, but yeah, it's it's I, I've, a lot of it, that work is it stemmed so much from from those papers he published. So it's been great. No, well, no, I appreciate you coming on, mate. It's been it's been a great chat and really interesting to see how you guys are doing it and how that's kind of developed and how cricket's developed over the last 10, 15 years of, of your with your involvement. Anyone that wants to get hold of the papers that you've done, get in touch. Social media, where's the best place? Um, I guess I, I'm on Twitter, so I'm at PCF Scott. Um, if you if you if you want anything in particular, want to chat or any questions or papers that that seem appropriate, give me a shout on that. Perfect. Thank you very much. Really appreciate no the chat, and um, look forward to look forward to chatting soon. Cheers, Rob. Thank you. Thanks, mate.